Today we're joined by Lord Norton of Louth, who's been described as our greatest living expert on Parliament and a world authority on constitutional issues. Lord Norton has been a Professor of Government since 1986. He has served as the convener of Campaign for an Effective Second Chamber and previously sat on the Constitution Committee in the House of Lords. In this episode of the Codex Cast, we will cover areas such as the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So without further ado, thank you, Lord Norton, for joining us. My pleasure. I think I'm right in saying you've dedicated your life to the study of Parliament and the Constitution. So what is it about constitutional law that you enjoy so much? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that um, I've always been fascinated by Parliament. I'm one of these nerds who got the interest in the institution when I was extraordinarily young and I was actually engaging with politicians from about the age of 12 or 13. So uh, fascination by process um, and the nature of politics, because Parliament clearly is a part of it, although Parliament's not the body that makes law, it's the body that gives assent uh, to law. And coming back to my earlier point about the discipline of politics, Politics is about the resolution of issues of public policy where there's a dispute. Obviously, if there's unanimity, there's no dispute, there's no politics. If it's imposed, you've got a dictatorship, there's no politics. But where there's a dispute, there's debate, resolving issues is core to our political life, it's core to stability. And, and so Parliament clearly is part of our political system. So how it's structured, how it operates, is absolutely crucial to understanding how we go about. Uh, determining issues of public policy and of course how this compares with how it's done elsewhere so it, it's really that fascination with process uh, and then just the way that parliament itself actually operates in, in fulfilling that um, I just find the parliamentary process um, intrinsically uh, interesting how it's evolved over time uh, how it relates to people um, in terms of choosing members of parliament, how the commons operates, how the Lords relates to uh, the commons. So there's always been that fascination simply by understanding uh, the process. So Westminster as an institution contains many traditions, some would argue weird and others wonderful. And one pertinent example is Blackrod and the role they play uh, in the ceremony of the opening of parliament where you know, parliament slams the door in Blackrod's face as a symbol of the authority of the House of Commons. So could you discuss some of the traditions which you find the most interesting? Well, we, we have a lot of, uh, as you say, a lot of traditions. I mean, they don't take up that much time, but they are important, particularly symbolically. I mean, where traditions have lost their purpose, we've generally got um, rid of them. Um, they're no longer pertinent. I mean, it used to be the case in the House of Commons, if you wanted to raise a point of order while a, a division, a vote was going on, you had to uh, have a hat on. So they used to have a, a, a ceremonial top hat, one of the ones that would flap out. If anybody wanted to raise a point of order, it had to be thrown to them so they could put it on to raise a point of order. And it was realised that was a bit silly, so they did away with it. Um, there was no practical relevance and no great symbolic relevance. Whereas other traditions there are, which you've touched upon, Black Rod, who has quite a busy day job, but when it comes to state opening, has the ceremonial job of going to the House of Commons, knocking on the door, and the door being slammed in Black Rod's face. Now, that is symbolically important because Black Rod is actually a, a crown servant and it's to symbolise the independence of the commons that they're keeping uh, Black Rod out. Um, and similarly, another great tradition, which is somewhat controversial, it is uh, the state opening of Parliament. That's when the two houses come together and actually joined by senior judges, Justice of the Supreme Court, the diplomatic court to the Queen's speech. Now, this is symbolically important because it's the one occasion when Parliament is actually meeting, it's gathered together. So when the two houses join, so because legally Parliament is the Queen in Parliament, this is the one occasion when the Queen is present with her two houses. It is symbolically important. And of course, she reads out the speech indicating the government's programme for the session. So it has constitutional significance. Um, Members of the House of Lords get slightly irritated nowadays because whenever you get stories about the House of Lords and people want to discuss Lords reform, there's always a picture accompanying it of the state opening of Parliament when peers are wearing robes. The one occasion only when peers wear robes and has no practical significance to the work the House does. And it's not 
the House of Lords, it's actually the state opening of Parliament. It's Parliament gathering into chamber of the Lords, but it's not the House of Lords as a legislative body. So that rather irritates us and we'd like to do away with those pictures being carried. And quite a number say, well, perhaps we should stop wearing our robes. Someone else pointed out, well, even if we stop, they'll use old stock photographs of us in our robes. Um, but the occasion itself, as I say, is, is symbolically important. So we do have traditions uh, that reflect that. And quite often it is those that reflect the separation within our system between now Crown and Parliament and in Parliament between the two chambers, the difference is there. So they, they, they reflect that. And I think that does have some constitutional symbolic importance without, as I say, taking up a great deal of time. So it just sends out the significance of the relationships that are still at the heart of our constitutional system. So on the topic of the House of Lords, you know, for many, many years prior, the House of Lords included hundreds of hereditary peers. The House of Lords Act 1999 abolished all but 92 hereditary peers and reformed the Lords into a chamber uh, which primarily features appointed Lords. So could you explain the benefits and drawbacks of both hereditary peers and appointed peers? And which of the two do you think is the optimal type for the House of Lords to primarily consist of? Well, I think the House of Lords over the past 50, 60 years has reinvented itself because, as you say, there's the 1999 Act. But prior to that, there was the 1958 Life Peerages Act. So that was the first one that, apart from law law, allowed members to sit for life to be um, given a peerage for what they themselves had done without the title carrying on beyond their lifetime. So you start to see the growth of life peers. They became a significant element, but a minority. The 1999 Act, as you say, swept away uh, several hundred hereditaries, and they'd been the dominant until then. So the two acts combined completely transformed our second chamber from one based on the hereditary principle to, if you like, one based on the merit principle, so we like being a meritocracy. Um, because of political negotiations, the 1999 Act, as you say, kept 92 hereditary peers, uh, two are ex officio, so it's 90 in practice. Who, in the house it's probably important to say they were themselves elected from all the hereditary peers to carry on um, and it was what i'd regard as a sensible election they were elected to carry on because they would got something to offer they were specialists in a particular area they're being particularly active and so on um, and de facto they themselves are the equivalent of live peers because their seat in the house doesn't carry on to their heirs, if one of them dies under the act, another hereditary is brought in, but they're elected from outside peers and 15 of them are elected by the whole house. So it tends to be a case of selecting somebody who's got qualifications, you can see why they'd be a member of the house. Um, now, obviously there's an issue about whether that should continue, but so long as it does, that's how it, it operates. So as a result, there's not really much of a difference in practice between hereditary and live peers in the way the chamber um, operates. So the only way you can tell the difference is through the titles, not through the actual activity in the house itself. So what they contribute, uh, hereditary peers is pretty much the same as live peers. Um, there is pressure to get rid of that hereditary element to close off the by-election option. So we don't have more hereditary coming in through that uh, route. But even those members who are pressing for that take the view that the hereditaries who are currently members of the House should remain they're becoming in effect live peers. It, it's for the future that the option would be closed off so we weren't electing hereditaries. And any hereditary peer who came into the House would come in as a live peer on their own individual merits uh, and not through this particular route. Yeah, so the, the House of Lords in its current form seems to be quite a controversial subject matter. Uh, some argue that it is an archaic and maybe an undemocratic institution which costs a country far more than the benefit it accrues. Others argue that the ability to combine leaders in various fields such as business and industry with those experienced in politics allows for a uniquely effective chamber which can scrutinise legislation from the House of Commons. As I mentioned, you've previously served as the convener of campaign for an effective second chamber. So what is your view that the, um, what is your view of the House of Lords as it currently stands? And are there any reforms uh, that you'd like to see implemented? Yes, quite a few, but it's working within the existing appointed house because of the two views you identified. I very much appreciate the 
and that house of lords doesn't cost actually uh, a, a great deal compared with uh, house of commons or for that matter the european parliament it, it's fairly lean in its organization the structures peers of course aren't salaried they're going to pay an attendant allowance but um the cost of the public purse per head of the member of the house of lords is something like a quarter or one sixth that of a member of the house of commons the last time they looked at the figures and um, so there's an argument i think it provides value for money in what it does uh, and it adds value to the political process and in terms of the principle you can justify it on democratic grounds you know it's quite probably it's undemocratic as if that's self-evident case and it isn't so the house adds value by doing fulfilling tasks that otherwise would not be fulfilled it complements the house of commons accepts the primacy of the commons which is relevant to the principle and um, so it seeks to complement it by doing things the commons may not have time to do or the political will so the lord's focus is very heavily on examining the detail of legislation the house of commons determines the ends the principle we don't challenge that we focus on the means the details of a bill could it be improved could it be uh, reworked in a way that would actually deliver its purpose more effectively and that takes up most of our time and we're able to do that because as the membership something you touched upon the house is a house of experience and expertise members are appointed usually because of positions they've held be it cabinet secretary chief of the defense staff head of a great charity or trade union and so on or because they're the leading experts in their field in science philosophy medicine and so on so they really know what they're talking about so they add value because it's distinctive from the commons where members elected to represent the views to promote their constituents to promote their parties but without actually being the experts because they get elected at a fairly young age lords tend to be appointed fairly later in life when they've established you know, their expertise and so on so we're able to look at it from a different perspective and in that sense add value and we make more of a difference to the detail of legislation than the house of commons uh, and ministers generally admit when a bill finally goes through that the work in the lords has really improved the quality of the legislation um, government has to take the house seriously no government has a majority in the house so you can't guarantee you're going to get your way you've therefore got to take it seriously so again that differs from commons because in the commons you've got the politics of assertion because the government's not got a majority it knows it gets way one side faces the other um in the lords it's more the politics of justification government's actually got to work at it persuade the rest of the house that what it poses um merits um support so a very different atmosphere somewhat more bipartisan people listen to one another regardless of party and there's a lot of discussion informally between the different stages of a bill someone will talk an amendment forward ministers will talk to them informally see if agreements can be reached so the lord's ants value particularly in terms of legislation valuable as well in scrutinizing public policy um particularly through select committees um some very um, effective committees distinguishable from the commons we don't have departmental select committees because that would duplicate the commons so we go cross-cutting issues like constitution economic affairs international relations and science and technology um uh, as well as set up committees each year just for that one session to look at particular topics so we do an awful lot of work which adds value it complements the work of uh, the commons if we weren't doing it wouldn't get done and whole chunks of bills would never be scrutinized because some bills come to us from the commons where they've not had the time to go through the bill we don't have any uh, program motions all amendments that are put down to a bill are discussed so it ensures a very thorough scrutiny so we add value to the work of the commons and the lords can be justified it's an appointed chamber as a result we accept the primacy of the elected house which ultimately could override us but we don't usually challenge it in a way that makes that necessary uh, and that relationship fits within um the concept of democracy because democracy is about the choice of who's going to govern you um government is rule of or by the people so it's how people choose who's going to be the governors if they can't do it themselves and that is done through elections to the house of commons so government is chosen through elections to the house of commons party with an overall majority forms the government electors know who they're electing and 
they know who to hold to account. They put the government in place, particular platform. If it doesn't perform as they wish, they can get rid of it at the next election. So there is what I term core accountability. There is just one body responsible for public policy, the government. And as I say, that operates through the House of Commons. We don't challenge that. We add value, but without challenging that fundamental principle. Now, if you had an elected second chamber, it would demand more powers than the present one, no doubt, and indeed use the existing powers that we don't. Because why not? It claim, well, we've got democratic legitimacy, we electoral legitimacy, we can challenge the first chamber. Now, if you've got two elected chambers in dispute, having to do deals to get something through, government loses control of the process. And the outcome is such, as a result of deals between the two chambers, electors don't know who to hold to account. It's no longer the government. Do they hold the Commons or the second chamber, the Senate or whatever, to account? So you lose that core uh, accountability. And I think that would actually be um, limit the electors because they wouldn't be, have one body. They can hold to account for the outcomes of public policy. So the Lords as an appointed chamber is justifiable on the democratic grounds and in terms of the way it actually carries out its job. Now, within the House, yes, the campaign for an effective second chamber has pushed for reform within the framework of an appointed chamber. We've actually been responsible for various changes, including acts of parliament. One that allowed us to get rid of members who committed serious offences, allowed members to retire, got rid of members who don't attend for a whole session, and we've got another act through as well that gives us the power to expel members if necessary in order to extend the power to pension. Um, further reforms, we want to reduce the size of the House. We're too big, we're looking at ways we can slim it down. On principle, we think we should be no bigger than the House of Commons. And we're looking at our structures and processes. We think what we do, we do rather well. We think we could do it even better. So we've recently been reviewing our committee structure to see how we can reform that particularly once we leave, well, well, we have now left the European Union. So the committees we've used to scrutinise European Union law, no longer relevant in the way they were before the scape for replacing them with other committees. So we have been looking at how we can strengthen what we do to reinforce uh, our fulfilling our functions even more effectively than presently fulfilled. So on the point of the harm of the House of Lords, uh, the, Wakeham, the Wakeham Report, which was published in the year 2000, contained many proposals for reform of the House of Lords, one of which was supported by the significant majority of those on the Commission and stated that represent, uh, representation should be extended beyond the Church of England to embrace other Christian de denominations in all parts of the United Kingdom and representatives of other faiths. So do you think that, um, that the Lords Spiritual, uh, which are the bishops who serve in the House of Lords, should be further extended to include other religions, and even denominations, or should it solely be uh, for the Church of England? Uh, in principle, I agree with what Wakeham recommended, and I think that would be a general uh, view. It's slightly misleading in the sense that, as you say, the Lord Spiritual are uh, the two archbishops and 24 senior bishops of the uh, Church of England, three ex officio, Durham, Winchester, and London. Um, and, and people do tend to focus on them, even though, how can I put it, they're not always the members. Um, and so what it omits is the fact we've got rather a lot of members of the House of Lords who are drawn from other faiths. So they're not necessarily there because of their faith, although Lord Sachs was appointed to be the chief rabbi. Um, they're appointed for other reasons, but you know, they're drawn from the main Christian religions. We've got Jewish members, Hindu, Sikhs, we had a Buddhist, we've got a Farsi, Zoroastrian, and we've got rather large humanist uh, association in the Lords as well. So we've got peers drawn from a wide range of religions but of course there is the focus on the Lord spiritual because they are there um, established by law yes in principle we should be having other faiths there you know as the spokespersons for those faiths um, the problem is not one of principle it's one of practice it's fairly easy having the Anglican bishops in because there's a hierarchy you've got archbishops and bishops so the senior ones can be appointed the other one, obvious religion with a clear hierarchy, is the Roman Catholic Church. The problem there is does, it's the church. They don't let priests serve in legislatures. So you know, there have been attempts, not least to uh, get 
archbishops of Westminster or those have retired, like Paul McMurphy O'Connor, the ones to try and get him into the house, and that advanced fairly well on, I think, and then it was blocked, but not by the rules. Um, so that's the problem there, that's not us. Now, with other faiths, you've got the problem of they're not necessarily hierarchical. So it'd be a case of do you leave it to them to determine who it would be? Obviously, you've got a problem with Quakers because you've got a completely flat authority structure. So it'd just be a case of deciding how do you want to do it. As I say, in practice, quite often you get them in any way. So members of the House, we've got several um, um, who have, uh, one or two, I think, have retired, but who've been presidents of the Methodist Conference, for example. Uh, as I say, we have the chief rabbi. Uh, we've actually got two who are uh, rabbis in their own right. Um, uh, and we've got various others who are um, you know, ordained clergy who sit for other reasons. Um, so as I say, it's a practical issue. How do we choose the religion? What do we just hand over them and say, you know, nominate who or something like that. So it, it just making progress on the practical elements. I don't think there's a great objection of principle to uh, achieving it. So the argument would be, how do they do it? And uh, uh, sort of implicit in Wakeham, um, how do you divvy up the allocation among the other religions? So, but that again, you know, it's a, it's a practical point. So not averse to, you know, taking it further, seeing what progress uh, could be made on that because we do actually benefit enormously through having these members who are drawn from a wide range of religions, wide range of other backgrounds. The more diverse we are, uh, the more we benefit from people being able to bring their particular perspective and particular experience to bear. So we've touched on the allocation uh, maybe between the different religions and different religious uh, dom denominations, but um, there, there's been criticism of the existence of Lord Spirituals in the House of Lords. The British Humanist Association uh, said it was unacceptable that the UK is the only Western democracy to give religious representatives the automatic right uh, to sit in the legislature. Uh, so is the existence of the Lord Spiritual an infringement uh, of the principle of the separation uh, between church and state? Uh, yes, um, because obviously they are part of the legislature and in, in a way it does reflect the nature of our state that initially everything was uh, uh, combined and of course both the particularly the lords comes out of the king's council which predated the emergence of the house of commons um which is when you had uh, was a combination of the earls and barons and the the, the leading pre prelates so the church of england was very much to the force that's been very much part of our history if you like it is still uh, a part of it and it's not just in House of Lords, of course, because the Church of England is by law the church established. So it's still part of the, uh, if you like, the, the state structures. So that's a distinctive feature of our uh, system. Now, whether you want to keep um, bishops as of right in the way that we do, you could slim it down, uh, bring some in on their merits. And it's not unusual for Lord Spiritual once they've retired, they're the only members of the House who retire on a certain age. Uh, uh, and they're not peers, they're Lords of Parliament. But once they retire, if they've been particularly active, quite often they're made life peers. So we get them in any way. Uh, Lord Harris, for example, used to be Bishop Oxford. He sits on the cross bench and he's given a life period. Um, typically former archbishops are made life peers. So you could bring them in in their own right anyway, without doing it on a, uh, you know, an established basis. But that's the origins of it. Um, you know, initially the prelates was very much to the fore. It's only over time that they become a you know much smaller element uh, of uh, the legislative process. So now I think we'll go on to questions about the House of Commons. So what are your, your views on the United Kingdom's executive being drawn from the legislative branch compared to countries like the United States, where the legislative legislature and the executive are separate institutions? Oh, I think it's very beneficial to have a parliamentary system in a way for reasons I touched upon earlier, because it provides for accountability. Um, government is drawn through the legislature and answers to the people through the legislature. So as they've got court accountability, it's the government that's governing and people know who to hold to account. Now, once you start to divide that a separate election, uh, a presidential system, which is denoted by the fact that the head of state is elected separately from uh, the legislature, 
you've then got problems of accountability. You might say, well, you've got direct accountability, but you, uh, in terms of the individual who holds the office, you don't necessarily have core accountability in terms of the policy that results from the political process. So if there's a conflict between, say, the president and the legislature, um, who do people hold to account for the outcomes? So you see the problems in the United States because you can get conflicts between the executive and the legislature, and of course within the legislature, two elected chambers, conflicts between the two houses. So at times you've got the problem deciding, well, who is responsible for the domestic policy of the United States? Who do we hold to account? So you get conflict, uncertainty, uh, and most especially um, a decision-making process that's fairly opaque because deals are struck, you don't know, you're not privy necessarily to that deal-making process. You just get the outcome. And who do you hold to account? So we know from studies that have been done, there's not much relationship between what Americans want and what Congress produces. So there is that um, problem in the nature of the system. Um, lots of elections, but not necessarily core accountability for the outcomes of public policy. In our system, you've got that. That's the value of our system and the nature of parties, because you, you elect a party, it's got an overall majority in government, people know who, who to hold to account. The rare occasions that doesn't happen, as we saw with the 2019 uh, Parliament, you can see some of the problems arising in terms of who governs. Who do you hold to account? Because to some extent during that short Parliament, Policy was being determined by a transient majority in the House of Commons, not a body that could be held to account by the electors. So that was the exception. The danger is if you have separation of, well, separation of election, separation of election between executive and legislature, that would more likely become the norm. So you, so you touched on essentially what I was going to ask you next, which is that the Fixed Term Parliaments Act 2011 has come under fire for the impasse it arguably caused in 2019. When Prime Minister Boris Johnson found himself uh, with a minority government, he lost the DUP as informal partners, but he couldn't call a general election due to the two-thirds vote requirement for a snap election under the law. And this was until the early Parliamentary General Election Act 2019 was passed, uh, which was abnormal in that it bypassed the constitutional law of its time through the standard simple majority vote to pass the legislation, which arguably renders the Fixed Term Parliament Act 2011 as potentially uh, you know, useless. So what are your views on the Fixed Term Parliament Act? And do you agree with the notion that it should be repealed and replaced? Um, you touched on a very, your last two words are extremely important, and replaced. Because um, if you just repealed it, Parliament would continue in perpetuity. Um, because the 2011 Act repealed the earlier legislation, the Septennial Act as amended by the Parliament Act, stipulating a five-year maximum life of a, a Parliament. Yes, the 2011 Act um, was uh, a compromise measure. It was rushed. It was part of the coalition uh, agreement. It hadn't been thought through in terms of the initial uh, proposal. It, it didn't include uh, provision for the House of Commons to remove the government through passing a vote of no confidence, which is actually a fundamental point at the heart of our constitutional arrangements. Government rests on the confidence of the House of Commons. Um, injecting the provision for an early election through a two-thirds majority limits government the reason you've touched upon um, it's got to go to the house so in effect that provision gives a veto power to the opposition because it can not vote for it which would block it as long as it's got at least a third of the members of the house of commons which normally it has and of course it doesn't have to vote against it doesn't say we're voting against it that election it can say we've got reasons well you know it won't work we'll abstain and that's sufficient because the act requires a two-thirds majority of all MPs, not two thirds of those voting. So it gives a veto power to the opposition. And when you think about it, technically as well to backbenchers who could stop uh, it happening. And as you say, Boris Johnson found himself stymied by that. So the only way around that is either passing a separate act has happened eventually by a simple majority uh, to get it through, although it applied the uh, basic rules for the, two thousand, it applied the provisions of the 2011 Act operation of the election and the sort of resetting of the clock on election. Or the alternative is for the House to pass a vote of no confidence in the government, and that's sufficient by a simple majority. 
and the act stipulates it has to be that this house has no confidence in her majesty's government so a government can no longer bring forward a motion of confidence in itself if that's defeated it doesn't bring it down it has to be a motion of no confidence not a defeat of no confidence so all sorts of problems attached to the 2011 act as we've seen so some arguing something you touched upon said initially oh well it's a dead letter because obviously the commons will always vote for the election as we discovered uh, no <laughs> um and uh, boris johnson three times had it voted down uh couldn't get it through um so there is i think a general view it needs to be replaced the constitution committee and house of Lords is taking an inquiry at the moment and under the 2011 act there is a requirement anyway, because we got this inserted when it was going through the House of Lords, for a, a, a formal review of the Act this year, well actually now, between June and November of this year, has to be reviewed. The committee's got to be set up and come forward with recommendations as to what to happen to it. But I think there's a general view um, that it needs to be replaced. Um, and I think you'd probably find broad support for reverting to a five-year, well, keeping a maximum five-year life, but within that, allowing the um, Prime Minister to recommend to the Crown uh, a dissolution of uh, Parliament and fresh elections called. You'd have to provide for that now by uh, uh, statute, because as I say, the early legislation has been repealed. There's, a, there's an argument as to whether the prerogative would automatically come back, but you'd still have to provide in statute for the maximum life of uh, uh, a parliament so i've just put it all in a um a replacement act or you could amend the 2011 act just keep the provisions for the actual electoral process the five-year maximum but take out section two dealing with you know the super majority for an early election there's no conflict uh, and just put in provisions to revert to what existed before 2011 so the Parliament Act 1911 and 1949 reformed the House of Lords, for example, by replacing the right to veto bills with the right to delay bills uh, from the House of Commons. So what are your, your views on the Parliament Act 19, 1911 and 1949 and the way in which they reformed the power balance between the House of, Lo uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords? Well, one can do quite an extensive analysis. I say that because I've actually <laughs> written various articles on the passage of the 1911 Act. It was by no means certain that would be the outcome. It shows the nature of politics. The uh, what the initial view was, how it's going to be dealt with, was different to the actual act uh, that got onto the uh, statute book. And the dispute at the time was: Do you change the composition or do you change the powers? Um, and eventually, the government pressed for and got through the act, which as you touched upon, limited the powers, so we can only delay legislation, um, which don't really use the power anyway, except since the 1949 Act, it's only been used four times. Um, um, but it was used in 1911, the government opted for that, because that's the quick option. You just limit the powers. If you start messing about the composition, that would take uh, a, a great deal of time. They did put in the preamble that it was sort of a temporary measure until you could ha have a house chosen on a more representative basis. Um, but um, governments have been a bit reluctant to pursue that because it also made clear that if you changed uh, that, made it on a more representative basis, you'd have to revisit the powers of the house as well. Um, and so governments have been a bit reluctant to follow that through because um, it'd been given more power to the second chamber, which therefore would limit government, dominate, which is not as its domination in the first chamber. Um, so, yes, it was a political act um, by a Liberal government to get its way, given that it was in danger of being blocked uh, by a Conservative-dominated um, House of Lords. But it's interesting that the debate itself wasn't really about the principles of the relationship between the chambers. So it wasn't some grand debate about what is the role of the Second Chamber in our, our political uh, system, um, whether you were for or against House of Lords reform, wasn't about your role as how you saw the principle. It was whether you were for or against Irish Home Rule, um, because the House of Lords at the time was seen as an impediment to achieving Irish Home Rule. If you're against Irish Home Rule, you saw the House of Lords as some great constitutional bulwark to be defended and admired. 
if you wanted Irish Home Rule, you're all for law changing the, the Lords and limiting its powers. So the bill could be got through. Uh, and once you got the Parliament Act and so the powers of the Lords were limited, opponents of Irish Home Rule then shifted the focus and suddenly decided that referendums were perhaps a good thing. So particular provisions of our constitution, like the second chamber, the use of referendum, um, and not necessarily advocated, you know, from first principles on their own merits, that their means to an end. This is the outcome we want. What's the way to do that under our constitution if it's not achievable under existing means? Which has always been the argument for referendums. It's never been argued on its merits. It's, um, you know, whatever proposal I want to get through, can't get it through the existing parliamentary process. Oh, well, let's try a referendum. We might know. What we want that way. So, it, it, as I say, it was the politics of the period that, that mattered, the views on Irish Home Rule, that largely shaped views on what to do with the House of Lords. Um, and it was got through because, as I say, the Liberal government wanted to achieve change, the Lords were seen as a blocking. Um, and so, limiting the powers was, if you like, the quick way uh, to do it. So, you touched on referendums there. So, what are your views on referendums as a, as a means by which we can, uh, you know, make decisions uh, in our country? Uh, well, I've always argued against them on principle. I'm unusual for actually taking a principle stance for the reasons I've just touched upon. I get extremely annoyed when colleagues used to come up to me and say, well, I'm again, I so agree with you. I'm so against referendums, except on X. X being their really key project they wanted to get through and didn't think they'd get it through the existing party president. Well, I'm sorry, you're either for or against them on principle not as a means to an end uh, and they're undesirable because they do challenge the core accountability of the political system because electors can't hold themselves to account for the outcome of a referendum so you know you hand it over to government to deliver on whatever the outcome is and if you don't like it, well, it, it it's it's too late um so you need and it militates against deliberation of considering options because the great thing about the parliamentary process is that proposals come forth, they're deliberated, uh, and the commons, the procedure in the commons, you've got a dominant party, you've got a majority, but the processes as such as to ensure that both sides of the debate are heard. And so you've got, if you like, an even playing field in terms of the rules, hearing the arguments and so on. Um, and you can consider a range of options, so you can move amendments. Now with a referendum, it's a blunt tool, Generally, you're for or against, yes or no, or two mutually exclusive propositions, as with the EU uh, uh, referendum. Uh, and then you've got problems about how to ensure an even playing field. Um, can you limit the spending of the two sides rather than one outspending the other? We've variously attempted to do that, but it, it's problematic. Um, uh, and what happens if all the mass media are in support of one side and argue for it and so on? So there are problems with process, how we structure it to ensure if I can, uh, debate and making sure you've got a question that is unambiguous and un unbiased. Um, so the Electoral Commission can advise on that um, uh, and tries to make sure you've got a you know, fairly clear view. But as we see at times, people debate, well, what does that one side mean compared to if we vote for uh, the other. So it doesn't necessarily determine you know, a result. People want to come back and say, well, it's very close, we should have another referendum and, uh, and so on. So there are all sorts of problems attached um, in practice, but mine is more to do with the, the principle of it. Um, we should resolve issues through a parliamentary process because you do actually have core accountability through that. Um, strictly speaking, referendums are unaccountable. So you touched on that um, instead of referendums, uh, you know, these issues should be resolved, uh, you know, in Parliament. But what happens if you find yourself in a situation where, you know, the public's opinion uh, vastly contradicts uh, Parliament's opinion and there are no parties which can, you know, actually win and be become the government? So how, how would you deal with, how would you deal with that? Well, usually they then get parties coming up that can deal with it, movements coming up very quickly, as we saw with the, you know, with uh, Brexit party and so on, and actually getting most seats in the European Parliament and so on. Um, so what tends to happen, I think the one of the benefits of our system, um, because that core accountability, the way we do elections, um, government is responsive in between elections. 
for the very reason I touched upon earlier, it knows it can lose the next election. So it can't assume, oh, we can do a four, you know, we might lose support, but we can have a form of musical chairs, do post-election bark and stay in office. No, you might be swept out of office. So you can't ignore electors in the interim. So if there's clear public support for a policy, government doesn't normally just ignore it. Um, it, it may adapt, modify, uh, and you've got the opposition challenging it if it doesn't. So as I say, other parties may come up uh, and people can then support those if they feel so strongly on the issue that the issue itself is paramount and uh, superior to the other issues that, that parties are associated with. So I think the system is sufficiently uh, adaptable simply because uh, you maintain that accountability. If the government's not delivering what you want, you get rid of it. Well, we've come to the end uh, of our conversation and, and this was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so we covered the House of Lords, we covered the House of uh, Commons and many issues in between. So again, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully I'll see you again. Yes, it is my pleasure. Thank you very much.